What's up, people? GNR TV, streaming done right. It has all the channels that you would want. You know, the regular channels, channels from out of state, pay-per-views, sports, the movie channels, porn. It has over 2,000 channels in general. Over 2,000 channels. $20 a month for two devices now. Not one, but two devices for 20 bucks, and you get all that amazing stuff. And I know what you're thinking. Oh, there's no sports right now. There's not really many pay-per-views. Well, guess what? There is sports because UFC is back. And there's pay-per-views because guess what? UFC is back, and the rest of the sports will be back eventually, and it's worth it. This app is freaking amazing. I highly, highly, highly recommend it. I've had it for a little over a year now. I'm never going to get rid of it, and I love it. I love it so much. GNR TV, streaming done right. If you don't have it, you need to get it. And enjoy the rest of the show. Let's get slicing and dicing with Sir Sturdy Horror fans. On this podcast, you will hear me and a guest do some movie reviews, random funny horror chats, and whatever else comes to mind. So tune in, kick back, relax, and always remember, I'll see you in your nightmares. Jason's mask. How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another exciting episode of Horror Research 30. Today I have my guest Dave with me. Dave, how's it going? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing pretty good. We just talked for a few minutes about this whole COVID thing. And what I forgot to mention was, I think one positive about this COVID, minus people getting sick and all that, because there's nothing good about that, is I got to po- I got to record so many episodes since this thing started, like at least 40, if not more. I just got to keep working on getting the rest of them out. I dropped two a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. But I mean, I guess that's one positive about it. I got to work perfect on something that my passion, work on that and meet some cool people like yourself. So that's something positive I can pull from this whole COVID-19. Yeah, um, I work with a writer uh, who uh, has been working on the project with me, and not only has he been able to keep up with the work on this project, but he says he finished three other screenplays that he uh, basically has been shelving for years, Um, and uh, just a lot of people got to focus on things that they didn't really have time for, and they were going and living normal lives before COVID, so um, yeah, there is a bit of silver lining to it, and I think people have enjoyed maybe a bit of a, you know, like there is some positives that, you know, giving you the ability to focus and just hang out and do what you want, spend your own time the way you want it, you know? Yep. You're right about that. And I noticed that you have the jaws in the background, which I think is freaking awesome. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's, um, that's Bruce Shark UK. Um, the guys over there, Martin Raleigh in, uh, in England, uh, they sent me that when they became aware of the project. Uh, it's a 30 inch, uh, replica. I'll actually, I'll pull her up for you. And uh, she's a beaut. She's pretty accurate um, as far as, you know, looking like the movie shark. Mm. Um, And uh, I'm getting a stand. There's a stand that comes with this they're sending that has three yellow barrels from the film in it as well. Wow. But, um, yeah, really uh, nice little detail in there. And um, and then, of course, uh, for the project, we have this is a uh, McFarland edition orca with uh bruce chomping on quint back there uh and uh you know got the barrels and some nice detail so uh there's even a little stuff inside you can see in the cabin it's got uh, the wheelhouse and stuff like that mm-hmm. so there's a lot of people have these they're uh they're out there um people are selling them on ebay and so forth that's so awesome those are awesome <laughs> those are freaking awesome yeah, they're great. I love the the shark is great. I did some those guys at Bruce Shark UK create um, some of the best models I think I've ever seen for Bruce sharks, and they actually have a, a fifty inch model, um, huge fifty inches, head to uh, tail to snout, and um, uh, they're gorgeous. And they have a couple busts that come out of the water with some barrels around it and stuff like that, little dioramas. So uh, I definitely recommend Bruce Shark UK. Check those guys out if you want to get a really good Bruce shark. Um, and they got all other kinds of merchandise as well. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Now, 
were you how are okay or uh what got you into horror like was it well i've i've always been a film fan um you know in general i love horror i think uh you know it's funny my son and i both talk about where horror has come and where it's gone now and and we're both sort of um we, we've gotten a little bit uh, tired of things like typical jump scare films and, and films that kind of rely upon things that kind of you telegraph ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So we're much more into the suspense genre and, and, and thrillers that know how to kind of surprise you in ways that are not like jump scares and things mm -hmm. and just creep you out in general. Um, the, uh, you know, I grew up um, with, uh, you know, Jaws was the first movie I ever saw in the theater besides like a Disney movie. Mm -hmm. And it's because of my background living on Martha's Vineyard and I was an extra in Jaws as a five-year-old kid. So I went to the movie out of a personal curiosity and just wanted to see what it was like because I thought it was going to be a monster movie like Godzilla or Gamera or any of the kid movies that I was watching where there wasn't a lot of like suspense to it. It was just cool looking, you know? Yeah. Um, but Jaws terrified me because the fact it was suspenseful. It was very... You know, you didn't see the shark for a lot of the film and, and the music and the suggestion of the shark with the POV shots under swimmer's feet. And, and it was just, it was really surprising. Um, but, um, you know, from Jaws, uh, you know, I went uh, a few years later in 79 to see Alien. And Alien is one of my favorite movies, period. Uh, I think Ridley Scott did an, just did an incredible job. Um, you know, it's funny because it was pitched as Jaws in space when they, they pitched to the studio. And that's exactly what it is in many ways, because you don't see a lot of the alien in that movie either. You know, it, it takes a while to get to see it. Mm -hmm. It starts off as the face hugger. And then later on, you see the actual full size alien, which is again, just like Jaws, bigger than the average alien that we're used to seeing. Um, and uh, there's a lot of tension in those shadows where you don't see the alien coming until he's right up against you and, you know, like Dallas in the tunnel, you know, trying to like find the alien before they realize how much a how much of a predator it is, and it's outsmarting him. But uh, I love uh, horror, sci-fi, action, adventure. Um, that's been you know all these films. I'm really impressed by the artistry of all these films to tell their stories really well. And uh, you know, from The Matrix to um, you know, uh, Unforgiven to other horror films, uh, you know, the, latest, the, the ones recent like The Conjuring and so forth. Oh, I, uh, I like those films. I enjoy something that, you know, I, I like to get scared. I think we all kind of have a primal like enjoyment, like riding a roller coaster. We know it's going to be, you know, there's anticipation and you hope that it's going to be thrilling. And the, um, the, uh, the excitement around that, you know, my girlfriend hates horror films, but she has such a good time watching them with me. You know, uh, as long as it's not too gory, because I think gore is one of these easy things to sort of do to like gross people out. But most films don't need to be gory if they're really well directed to be scary. You know, mm -hmm. um, Hereditary uh, was one of those films, too, where I felt, wow, you know, they, they it definitely had its gore. But just some of those shots with some of the figures in the background, sort of you didn't see them until they emerged from the background, like hugging the wall. Uh, in the dark corners, that stuff just freaks me out, you know, and, and that's a movie that I thought was so skillful at, at getting the, the, the tension, you know, that you, everything's right there on the screen, but it's still freaking you out, you know, you're definitely, you know, it, it reaches you, and that's what I love, so horror films, sci-fi, anything that does a great job at telling a story and keeping me entertained and, and takes me out of my space and out of my head for two hours, you know, that's what I'm all about. I'm with you on that. And going back to Jaws, what you said about Jaws, about how the suspense, because they barely show the shark. That's something I really, really, really love about that movie, because you see shark movies now, which I'm one of those people, I don't know what it is about aquatic horror, good or bad, I'm entertained by it. But a lot of the newer movies, they show the shark, I feel they show it a little bit too much, and if the shark doesn't look, I think the problem is with me, for me at least, is the shark doesn't look all that great. Sometimes it's too CGI, and it just looks, it looks terrible. But when you don't see it too much, you know, you see it here and there, it's not bad. You know, it's not, it's not bad, and then it's more suspenseful. It's like, okay, you're not seeing it swimming. You're not seeing the shark swimming up to the person. Like in Jaws, you're pretty much seeing the shark's point of view when you're underwater, swimming up, you know, under the people and all that. You see the shark here and there a few times in the movie. And then when you see the shark in the movie, it's a, a huge impact because it makes an impact in that movie, in the original Jaws especially. 
And then it just, you know, then it kind of disappears in the water again, comes back out and you see it a little bit more. A lot of times you just see the fin and that's, I just really like that about that movie. I just, I really enjoy that movie. I really enjoy the movie. Yeah, I agree. I, I think a lot of the same things that make that film effective, what you just talked about, the, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, the ocean is a lot like a dark, scary house. You know, you can't see in the darkness and, and, and visibility in the ocean is not all, usually all that high, especially up here in the Northeast where you go out in the ocean and you might see six, seven feet in front of you, um, you know, in, in the Atlantic, um, mm -hmm. a little bit further for, you know, lakes and so forth. But um, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the ability to hide the shark behind the, the, the lack of visibility in the ocean, I think is a real great device for getting you to feel that claustrophobia of, I just can't see it. I don't know. It's around me. I might, you know, you might know it's there. You just can't tell where it is. Um, other films that have done, you know, okay jobs. I mean, there's definitely, you know, we uh, talked recently about with, uh, another, uh, another person about Sharknado and so completely self-aware as a ridiculous parody of shark movies that it's not horror, it's just fun. You know, it's like, uh, uh, almost like an airplane version of uh, horror movies, you know? Yeah. And uh, the campy cameos from uh, actors from 90210, like Ian Ziering and, you know, the stupid stuff. I mean, you're talking about sharks in a tornado. Like, uh, you, you, the suspension of disbelief is pretty high right from the outset, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... Um, but I love, I was a huge fan of Deep Blue Sea with LL Cool J and Samuel Jackson mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and, and, uh, who was some of the other actors that were, um, uh, the uh, Rennie Harlan's in that it's a Rennie Harlan directed film. He has a cameo. Um, you know, they, they homage to Jaws, like the same Louisiana license plate that came out of the, the tiger shark in Jaws with Hooper and Brody. They mm -hmm. use that in there. Um. Uh, they try to create the same victim pattern, like male, female, animal. So uh, they do a little bit of tribute to it. And what I loved about Deep Blue Sea was the fact that the sharks are smart. You know, it's yeah. not just that they're um, that they're vicious and large, but now they're intelligent, uh, and that that gives you a little bit of. It's sort of like having a Hannibal Lecter for a shark. You know, like he's crafty. He's not just like hungry and can tear you apart if he gets to you. He can figure out how to make you think he's not there. Uh, and, of course, that, that Samuel Jackson, like, you know, victory speech trying to get everybody, you know, riled up. And then that sudden, like, you know, death by, from the pool um, is just it's a classic scene, you know, where it's just you love that because nobody expected that to happen. And I think that's one of those great little surprises in cinema. So shark films are, you know, Jaws is always at the pyramid, the top of the pyramid when it comes mm -hmm. to shark movies. And there's a couple of others like Deep Blue Sea and, and, uh, and then like some of the ripoff films like Orca that came out in 77, two years after Jaws, um, which did an okay job, I think, of working with the same themes. But um, yeah, there's, you know, everybody's like, can we ever get anything better than Jaws? And I was like, they can try. I don't know how they're going to get there. You know, Jaws is classic, legendary, you know, any, and anybody talks about a remake and it's a four letter word. They're like, don't you dare. You know, it's like, it's like saying we're going to like improve on Dom Perignon. You don't need to. It's already exactly the way it should be. I'm with you on that. And it's funny because I had this conversation recently about Jaws as far as shark movies living up to it. And I was like, there's never going to be a shark movie that comes close to it just because it just... When Jaws was made, I mean, obviously I wasn't born then, but when it was made, like when it came out and then just watching it in general, it was damn near a perfect movie in my opinion. Like they did exactly what they were supposed to do for that movie. And then I feel like a lot of films did try to follow it up, follow up with their own films. And it just, it's one of those things where it's like, yeah, make a shark movie, but just don't try to make it like Jaws. You can pay some homage to it if you want to. That's cool. But just go in another direction than Jaws because you're going to, I feel you're going to hurt yourself in a sense of, you know, sometimes a movie will come out and it'll say just as good as Jaws. I can't think of an exact quote or whatever, but like, you know, just as good as Jaws or better than jaw you know like the remake or better whatever the case may be and it's just like you're trying to you're putting that out there so people are going to expect it to be that good if not better and then when it's nowhere near it i'm not gonna say sometimes people just don't like the movie because it's nowhere near what they expected it to be and it could really be a decent movie or a good movie or a fun movie but it's just like okay you said it was going to be this and it was the complete opposite so i hate it and i feel you got to just kind of with 
with Jaws especially, you have to just kind of take your own lane. There's those movies out there, you know, that you can't really just say this is a remake of or this is like a reimagined version or, or whatever the case may be. This is like similar to, but our own stories. Like, no, just do your own shark movie or aquatic horror movies, which I do enjoy. And I do, I'm glad you mentioned the Orca because I've been meaning to watch that for the past like two years and still have not watched it. But I need, I feel like I need to. I've seen the previews for it, it look kind of fun at the very least. And I think the thing with that movie for me is, I mean, I grew up watching free Willy and like you see whales, you say you see people training whales on TV. So you see them as being friendly. So I feel like that right there is not that it's going to bother me. It's just that I'll take a different approach than a shark. Like I'm terrified. I'm scared of the ocean. Sharks is one of the reasons why not like a phobia. Like I'll pass out if I go near, I just, I don't feel like I need to swim in there. I can, there's pools for a reason, <laughs> you know? Sure. But yeah. That's, that's, uh, Deep Blue Sea is another, you're right though about Deep Blue Sea. That's probably, if I can think of it off the top of my head, that's probably the next best shark movie, Deep Blue Sea, in my opinion. I could be wrong. I might have to do a little bit more research, but I think that might be the next best dark shark movie. And again, you're saying they paid, they paid some homage to Jaws. They did similar things to it, but at the same time, they made, Deep Blue Sea, Deep Blue Sea. They made it their own movie. They made it their own thing. They made the sharks intelligent, which was I thought was pretty fun, like you said, and kind of funny. Fun and funny. Yeah, well, Deep Blue Sea has humor in it. You know, they had a lot of great scenes where I think I remember LL Cool J, he plays the chef, and he's always talking to Bird. He just calls him Bird, you know. That's and, uh, and uh, you know, he, he, the LL Cool J is drink, you know, drinking the, the, the white wine that he cooks with. And uh, the, the, the walls shudder and the water starts coming in. And he throws it down. He's like, all right, I take it. It's a sign. I get it. I got to quit drinking. Um, and, and other moments that are just, and that's, I think that great horror films to me do uh, two things. They, they create tension and then they release tension. Mm -hmm. And so there's a little bit of this sort of like, you know, push and pull where if you have a good scare and then you have a laugh, it's some there's some sort of a connection where that feels really good together. You know, you enjoy the, the, the suspense and then you get the payoff that scares the hell out of you. And then some witty character has some one liner or something, there's screams in a funny way and, and you get the laugh. And I think that's that, you know, that's a great Saturday night with a date, you know, like that's a great time at, at the movies, you know, but yeah, deep blue sea is, um, I agree. I think it's up there as like probably one of the more respected shark films uh, that, that you'll see and doesn't try to be Jaws. It nods to it because I think the director is clearly saying like, listen, we're not going to be as good as Jaws. We're going to be our own thing. We got to do a new kind of story here um, and, and try to make something that you are not expecting. But there's another film that I thought was really well done. It was a, an independent film and it was a great idea because it was based on something that actually happened in reality. And that movie was called Open Water. I don't know if you're familiar with Open Water. I've heard um, it, I haven't seen it. Yeah, it's it's great. It's um it's basically about a true story based based on an actual couple that was on their honeymoon in Australia and they went out on a dive charter with, you know, a whole bunch of other people and you know, I've been scuba diving in, in South Florida and and you know, you the rule is that you have a buddy. Like every there's nobody alone, right? So everybody has a buddy so that anything goes wrong, you have each other to to work on. But um this particular dive charter didn't count the amount of people that came up off the bottom and left this couple in the middle of the ocean um, and didn't realize for two or three days that they forgot them. So the film is really about them. You see the couple ahead of time, you know, they're happy, they're enjoying their honeymoon, they're in a beautiful Australia, and then they surface, the boats pulled away, and they're like, where'd they go? And the next two nights, they're left in the ocean, basically waiting for the sharks to take them out. And it has a very dark ending, um, which is similar to what actually happened in reality. Um, and uh, But it was made by a couple on weekends, you know, a, a guy named Chris Kentis and his wife. And they did it. They shot it on weekends in a, in a nearby beach because um, it was really simple in its premise, which you just needed a couple in the water and some underwater photography of the sharks. And then really, you know, really great night footage where it showed like lightning was going off and they could see the sharks beneath them only when the lightning was like actually illuminating the water. So it created that suspense of, oh, only, you know, the sharks are there, but only during those lightning strikes are they showing up. 
Um, so I think films like that are really inventive and it, it didn't want to be Jaws. It had sharks and it was based on a true story, which a lot of these shark films probably, I think it's one of the few ones that are actually based on reality, maybe except the Indianapolis story, you know, the actual Navy uh, disaster that happened uh, mm -hmm. where all those uh, sailors uh, were in the ocean after their ship was sunk by a, t by a torpedo. Uh, that actually Quint in Jaws tells the story about and why he has a vendetta against sharks because he survived the Indianapolis and he was one of only, you know, uh, 300 people that survived out of 1,100. Sharks took the rest July the 5th, 1945 or whatever the date was. I'll get in trouble for not knowing that date. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, the shark movies are tricky and uh, there's always going to be, you know, there's not many films that are, are sort of like, well, you're making a movie that basically has already the king at the top. Don't even try, you know, don't try to unseat that film. You're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And you might look really bad for even attempting to. So just do your own thing, you know, make, make your mark in your own way and try not to be Jaws. I agree. I agree with you 1 million percent. And it's just, and again, I'm somebody, I love aquatic horror. Like another one that I really enjoy was the original Piranha movie. I thought they did that really well. I thought it was a fun movie. And they didn't try to be Jaws at all. And I mean, they did a great job with it. They did a really good job with it. And then I've seen some bad shark movies and I'm just, <laughs> I'm one of those people. I, I have to finish it though. Like I watched one called Piranha Shark and I watched another one called Jurassic Shark. And it was just, <laughs> Just because just the titles alone captured me. I'm like, that guy, that has my interest. But then when you see how they look in the movie, which I understand budget and all that, again, going back to Jaws, which Bruce did look awesome, don't get me wrong, but going back to Jaws, like, they barely showed the shark. Like, in this movie, they showed the sharks a lot. They showed the little piranha sharks a lot, and they showed the Jurassic shark quite a bit. And it just looked bad. But I still watched the movie. I mean, I, I had to finish the movie. Yeah, there's um, a, a good friend of mine, uh, uh, John Campo Piano. Uh, he works with me. I work at um, uh, PBS in Boston. He's also he works for Frontline, the documentary series, and uh, he's a really smart guy, really knowledge knowledgeable about Jaws. And, and I work with him a great deal on on this project and other projects. But um, he loves those cheesy, bad rip off horror films. You know, he's he's got a, a huge collection. I mean, we watched Ticks recently with Clint Howard, um, you know, uh, The Ginger Dead Man with uh, Gary Busey, um, like really, really just horribly made films. Mm -hmm. But there's something to enjoy about how campy and ridiculous they are, you know, and, and, the, and the, the effects and the practical, like, you know, costumes and things that they made that are completely rubber latex, you know, and, 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 look like something that you'd do in a theater class for eighth yeah. grade or something like that. But, you know, they went for it, you know, they went for it. They made the movie, they got the financing, they put this stuff together and, and uh, they created a story and, you know, my hat's off to them for, you know, going through with it. And, and who knows, some of them probably made money in, and, and got a profit out of it. So good for them. Oh, the, you know, it's funny you bring that up because those cheesy movies, not just the shark ones, but the cheesy horror movies. I absolutely love the, ones, the B rate B movies or whatever they call it. There's one, actually, that I'm going to tell you about, and I recommend this movie to people so much. I have no idea why I love this movie so much, but it's a comedy horror movie called Thanks Killing about a killer turkey. And the turkey, <laughs> you can tell the turkey's like a puppet or whatever, but it's just, I, I'm just so freaking entertained by it. I've, as a matter of fact, I did two podcasts on this movie. That's how much I freaking love the movie. Wow. And I'm thinking about doing a third one. This will be my third and final one when I do do it. Because now I have my green screen. I didn't have my green screen the first two times. So I'm like, now nah, I got my green screen. I have to do it one more time. Mm -hmm. But um, I remember the first time, not the first time I watched it, but the first time I was watching it for a podcast. Because I wanted to get it out for Thanksgiving. And I, so I'm sitting there watching the movie in the living room. My wife stayed in the living room to watch that movie with me for about two minutes, if that, and just left. She's like, I, I, I can't. I, I can't watch this. It just left the room. But right. <laughs> she's not a, she, she loves horror, but she's not a fan of the comedy horror. Me, I'll watch anything at least once for the most part. But yeah, there's there's just something that I just grab. I mean, I love all horror, but I really do gravitate. There's those times where you're just like, you know what? I think what it is with the B-horror movies, one, they're fun, and they know what they're doing in it as far as, like, they know that it's not, like, a top-of-the-line horror movie. Not all of them, because some B-horror movies are freaking great, amazing, excellent movies, an excellent story. I mean, like, the more cheesy ones that are kind of making fun of themselves, 
they kind of they're going for that and it's one of those movies you can just kind of throw on say if you're for me for example if i'm editing a show or just hang you know you hang out with some friends or whatever having a couple of beers just kind of talking and shooting the shit you throw one of those movies on that you don't really have to pay too much attention to you just kind of glance at it for the cool kills or whatever happens and you go back to your conversation or whatever you were doing and i think that's one big thing i love about those movies is you can kind of just you know you don't have to again you don't have to pay focus on it all the time Right. Yeah. We, um, uh, the, the group of Jaws people, uh, that I hang out with good friends of mine now, um, that, uh, I've gotten to know over the past couple of years with this project and just through my friends, uh, we get together probably twice a year, once in the winter and once in the summer. And it's all about Jaws ripoffs for the most part. And we get together and we have a couple drinks and people don't mind when you're talking over the film or we're making fun of something a character says. You know, it's um, it's a good time. It's a communal experience, and you don't have to be worried about, you know, if you're watching a really good horror film, you, you don't tend to talk over it a lot. You're not really making it a social event. So I think the B-horror movies, it's more of a party atmosphere that you can enjoy. And, uh, and you'll, you know, and you'll make, you'll add to it because you're laughing at it together and, you know, make crack some jokes and so forth. Great. So we usually do a double feature of something cheesy, um, you know, that uh, my friend John will pick out usually because um, he knows them all. I mean, John's a huge collector. I, the one thing I've gotten to know about um, horror fans is how much, how rabid of collectors they can be and all these objects that they have. Um, uh, you know, John is a huge fan of the, the It films and the miniseries, and he's done a documentary on those. Oh, and, um, uh, you know, he's got a, one of the actual Pennywise costumes from the uh, miniseries from the... Uh, the nineties. And, uh, and so, um, you know, having these actual physical objects is really interesting to see that, uh, you know, they're a piece of history, you know, if you, um, uh, and you, if it's screen used, it's even better. Um, you know, I have my shark and my orca because they were gifts actually. Uh, I'm not a big collector. Uh, I'm more of a creator uh, or trying to be a creator at least. Uh, but I enjoy the films and, and, uh, being able to really just, you know, appreciate the entertainment for, you know how well it's made and how how much it transports me yeah that's that's what you just said is so true with horror fans as far as because i'm a horror fan i'm a collector myself and one thing i can tell you is it gets really expensive like once you add up to like holy shit i have all this stuff and my wife doesn't mind it because she likes some of the stuff too she likes i mean she's a horror fan too so she'll buy me stuff or grab herself stuff and it's just like it all it's just crazy how much it adds up and you're just like holy crap like i remember I think my very first figure was a Jason figure. And this was a few, like, I just started collecting maybe, oh, I don't even know how long ago, no, less than 10 years max, if that. I was always in the horror, but as far as like, collecting figures, because it's just about, you know, just buying us stuff. And once you, it's, it's like that saying with a bag of chips, you know, once you pop or once you have that one chip, you just can't stop. <laughs> or that first tattoo, once you get that first tattoo, you want more. And it's the same with collecting these figures. Once you start getting them, and it's just, it gets crazy. <laughs> it gets crazy, but I probably won't ever stop doing it. And yeah, I think it's it's one of these things that people are, you know, it's it's like, um, I don't know, maybe it's like gambling. You either, you get a bug for it and you're into it, or you, you just, it's not part of your kind of makeup, you know? Um, I've slowly... Well, it's funny because more I've worked on my project, uh, making the monster, and uh, this latest one that was Return of the Orca. Um, you know, people are giving me things because they want me to use them in context of the project. So, um, for example, um, a woman on Martha's Vineyard who was an extra in Jaws: The Revenge, uh, she gave me a part of the log cabin, a little piece of wood that the log cabin where Steven Spielberg stayed on Martha's Vineyard when he was making Jaws. They wow. tore down the log cabin um, a couple of years ago, but a number of people who um, you know wanted to preserve the, the history of this log cabin, where where they you know, basically they wrote the movie for the most part. You know, they were making up Jaws as they were shooting and writing new scenes every day um, and trying to adapt to the shark not working or certain other challenges. So Carl Gottlieb and and, and uh, Spielberg would work in this log cabin. So in many ways, it's not just a, like, it's not just some hotel room where the director stayed. It actually was part of the making of Jaws. That's so awesome. um, I got uh, I got a piece of the log cabin, a little piece of wood. Um, and then, uh, and actually I just picked up this shirt. I wore it special for this podcast. 
Um, this is, uh, uh, I was there on the vineyard. I've been working and on the project, and so I'm down on the vineyard regularly. I'm only about an hour and a half from being on Martha's Vineyard from where I live. So, but this uh, shirt is from the Wharf Pub, and the Wharf Pub is managed by Jeffrey Voorhees, who played Alex Kintner in Jaws, the boy on the raft, the yellow boy, the second victim in the film. Um, and so he works there now, and he has embraced his, um, uh, his uh, fame as Alex Kintner and advertises online to, if you want to come down to the Wharf Pub and get a signed T-shirt, um, if I turn around here, I'll see if I can show it to you. Basically, he signed it as the kid, the dead kid from Jaws. Oh, and, um, uh, you know, that uh, Jaws ate him back in the 70s. So, uh, and there's a picture of him on the back. But he sells the T-shirt, and he'll sign it for a little extra money. And, uh, you know, it's a little extra revenue for the place. So, slowly, I'm kind of, kind of becoming a collector, but um, not to that extent that some others. One of my friends is named uh, Peter Spadetti. Peter owns the actual fighting chair from the Orca, the, the chair that Robert Shaw sat in. Wow. It was over $30,000 at auction. So some people really go for it. And Pete's one of those guys. He <laughs> really went for it. <laughs> yeah, I like for me, I mean, I would if I could. If I could afford it, I'd be going for a lot of things. But like I have so – like horror is one of my huge hobbies as far as podcasting, collecting movies and all that good stuff. And then – I'm really into muscle cars, like drag racing and all that. I got into that because of my father. So now I have he, – he bought a Trans Am, 87 Trans Am GTA, brand new. He gave that car to me like a couple years ago. And we got a um, a 71 split bumper Camaro that we're working on. That's going to be my car for Street and Strip. He has a 69 Camaro that he's working on. He has a, a all-original 69 Chevelle. My other brother – my older brother has – I don't know what year his Mustang is, but he has a – I think it's a Fox Body Mustang. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure. And he also has a 69 Camaro that he races, and he's looking for another muscle. So it's just one of them things. It's like the things that I really enjoy are so damn expensive. So it's like I can only do right, like, right. get my toe in the water, so to speak. So to speak. I hear you. Yeah. No. Um. Uh. It's funny. I recently uh, became Facebook friends with a guy who was in Mad Max, and uh, he was a stuntman on Mad Max. Um, and uh, it's that was one of those cars, the Interceptor, the V8 Interceptor that that Max Rockettansky drew, um, drove for that film. I'm, I'm never I've never been a huge car guy, but I always loved that front hood scoop, like you know, turbocharged you know part of the, the hood mm -hmm. and the look of that car, you know, the black, which um, it's almost like I think the model I forget exactly what model it was, but it's sort of like you know they were old um, 70s uh, you know, like. Chevy Malibus and these other cars that basically had that really big, you know, kind of high swept um, uh, muscle car look to them. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Mad Max's car, I always thought would be really one of, cool is one of those cars that you could have. And there are people who built replicas uh, and bring them to shows for Mad Max and, and show that they've gone all out and spent, you know, probably forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 on getting the car to be as close to the original as they can. So it's pretty crazy, but I'd love to see one up close. I don't think I'd, I try to kick in fifty grand to have a Mad Max car, but it'd be cool to see one. See me, I'm with you on that. I, I feel now if I had the money to throw away, then yeah, I'm gonna be doing a lot of ridiculous things like that. But I feel like as far as vehicles go, it'd mostly be for me. It'd be mostly muscle cars. Like as far as like Lamborghinis, Ferraris, yeah, they're cool. But I'm not really into those. Like I'm not saying I would never want one, but. I'm not really like I don't I wouldn't care to have them that much for, for me if it's like okay I can get this 69 Camaro and do what I want to it or get this you know, Lamborghini it's worth a lot more right now it costs a lot more right now but I'm, I'm good I have more fun with the muscle car yeah well cars these days you get new cars and there's like you know you need a uh, you need no computer programming to get in the, under the hood you know as opposed to cars from the 70s and 80s and so forth and earlier, you know, they're, they're basically their machinery that, you know, you can understand the mechanics of it and, and have a lot more control over. Mm -hmm. So um, my girlfriend just picked up a 2017 Mustang convertible and uh, it's a beautiful car, but the amount of systems in there, it's like, I'm not going to be changing the oil for her. It's not going to happen. It's going to be somebody else who probably gets paid a lot to, to be able to handle working on that car. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, those kind of cars, her car purrs. It's a V8, you know, stick shift. 
um, the sound is just so, so beautiful. You know, it's mm -hmm. great. You know, this, when you drive a Honda Civic and, you know, it gets you from place to place and then you step into like a real car like that, a performance vehicle, it's a whole different relationship you have with it. You know, it's completely separate, you know. I know because I like my my um Trans Am. I'll drive that here and there. It's a gas guzzler, so I don't drive it a lot. And then I my everyday vehicle is a Rav Four, so it's like okay, I got to. I'm getting into this to go here and there, work or whatever the case may be. And it's just like yeah, it's it's a, it's, it's it's a vehicle. Like you said, it gets you from point A to point B. But then when you get into the real cars, it's like okay, now this is it. This is very enjoyable. Now with my Trans Am. There's no air in it, so that's like a downfall with it. <laughs> I think that's another reason I don't drive it too, too much, because it gets hot. Yes, you can put the windows down, but you got to crank them down. Right. You only get so much cool air in there from the wind, but I still love it. But I guess we can jump into uh, making of the monster and yeah. of, uh, whatever you can discuss with that. Sure. Let me, so let me give you the, the, the basic background um, so that people can sort of see sort of how it led to what's going on now. Uh, so I was, uh, I was, uh, I, I wasn't born on Martha's Vineyard, but I, I moved there very young, uh, just before I was five years old. And I turned five on the island as a, a resident of Oak Bluffs, uh, which is one of the more populated towns on the North shore of the, of the island. So, um, that was 1974 and, um, I was starting kindergarten and, uh, the movie Jaws came to town. They started shooting in uh, uh, late April on the, the vineyard, and I was taking swimming lessons uh, as was required by uh, Oak Bluffs for anybody that was, you know, hadn't lived there before and might be new to the water, which I was. So I was taking swimming lessons at the beach, and uh, I was also at Oak Bluffs Elementary where Lee Fierro was the drama teacher. Lee Fierro plays Mrs. Kintner in Jaws. She's the one who slaps Roy Scheider's character, Chief Brody, and is, uh, to me, an extremely critical part of that film. She's really kind of a motivating force in what that main character goes through and why he makes some of the choices he does. Lee was teaching the class and had been cast in Jaws and said, and we all knew about Jaws. Everybody was talking about it. You know, not a lot of people on Martha's Vineyard back then in the, in the off season. Um, you know, I think under 10,000 lived on the island year round uh, in 1974. And Lee said to the class, I've been cast in Jaws, and you all probably have been hearing about it, but I'm going to be in the movie, and they need some kids to be in this scene. So they asked me if I would talk to you guys about coming down and being in the scene. Um, you know, Jaws used a lot of local extras for uh, the film. They used quite a bit of the actual residents of Martha's Vineyard. They cast the principal roles, of course, through a traditional casting process and hired really professional actors that were well known for the, you know, the, the, the purposes of turning in the great performances for those central roles. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the other characters, um, some with speaking roles and some just extras, were all basically Martha's Vineyard residents. And I became one of them. Uh, I went, I took my swimming lesson and then I, um, uh, believe it or not, uh, which people find pretty incredible to hear, although if you knew the 70s, you, you would understand it wasn't too crazy at the time, but I hitchhiked from the beach where I was down to the set of Jaws about a mile and a half down the beach. Um, mm. A five-year-old kid sticking his thumb up and getting picked up by strangers was not a crazy thing to see on Martha's Vineyard in the mid-70s. Um, today, the police would be involved and the parents would be quickly charged. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, back then, it's just how hippies rolled, and that's who my parents were, were hippies. So, um, so I, was, I, was, I was encouraged to be very independent, and I was. Um, and I loved it. It was a really good time. And, and yes, I'm lucky a serial killer didn't you know, take me off the face of the earth. Yeah. Um, but uh, we rolled the dice, and I, 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 got the, you know, I didn't get snake eyes. But so uh, the scene that I ended up being in was the Alex Kintner death scene, when the boy on the raft, the yellow raft, is, uh, you know, Lee Fierro, his mom, Mrs. Kintner, lets him go out on the raft. He wants to stay out longer. His fingers are pruning, but she says, okay, just what, five more minutes. And uh, Roy Scheider is there on the beach, Chief Brody, and he's in the part of the film where the first victim has already been killed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he's, 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 he's struggling because he knows he probably shouldn't be caving into the local government and the mayor to just sort of blow this thing over and sweep it under the rug. He's in charge of public safety, but he's 
he's new to this place. So, um, but we've shot there that scene probably for a good six hours that day in cold water because it was only, you know, it was, if, if it was the beginning of May, it was, you know, it was not the Northeast and, and you're from the Northeast, you know, the ocean doesn't really warm up right now. I might go in the water off the vineyard or the Cape. Um, but, uh, certainly not in May or June. Usually I'll wait for it to warm up and August is about the time when it's like in that sweet spot. Yeah. Um, that it's like, okay, a little chilly, but you know, you're used to it in five minutes, so you're good to go. Um, so it was cold, um, and jumping in and out of that water for all the takes, there was a lot of takes. And every time that blood burst came up in the water, when the shark ate Alex, you know, we would have to reset and that blood would have to dissipate and leave the water. Uh, mm -hmm. and so you would wait, you know, 45 minutes to an hour just to be able to have the water clear of that blood and allow you to get back in and take the, do the take all over again. So, um, you know, it, it was a long day because we just had to, that was one element. We just couldn't, you know, reset ourselves. You had to wait for nature to do the resetting for you. So, uh, so I was in the film and literally if you watch the movie, uh, if you blink, you'll miss me. I'm in it so fast, but I am in the shot immediately following that famous dolly zoom of, of Roy Scheider. When the, uh, the boy is eaten, he sees it, he realizes he just saw the kid get killed and you get that real fast telescoping shot mm -hmm. on Roy. And, uh, you know, what they now refer to as the jaws shot. Uh, but originally was uh, the last time it was used before that was Vertigo, the Alfred Hitchcock classic to show the characters, you know, um, reaction to heights. And uh, so it was that zooming in and pulling back or, 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 or pulling back. Either way, it's basically playing with the, 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 the position of the camera and the telephoto lens, you know, zooming at the same time in the opposite direction. So, um, so. I saw the film the next summer because it was shot in 74, it came out in 75, they had an island premiere and it was really, uh, it wasn't the cast from the film, it was basically locals, Martha's Vineyard people who were invited to the screening to see themselves, see the movie, it was kind of a thank you by Universal Studios to say, hey, we, you know, you, everybody worked so hard to put this together um, because it was a collaboration between Hollywood and local, um, you know, citizens. Uh, Jaws wouldn't have happened without um, the, the vineyard uh, residents being able to enable that film to be made. Mm -hmm. um, as crew members, as extras, uh, as boat handlers, um, as uh, you know, some particular individuals like Lynn Murphy, who was instrumental in showing how to do certain things in the water, like tow the shark or make the barrels pop up and so forth. Um, the Hollywood people didn't know how to do a lot of this because they had never left the lot. They had their tricks that they did on a studio lot. Yeah. But on the location of Martha's Vineyard, where they were kind of, you know, it was, it was an idea on Steve, Steven Spielberg's to leave California and go to a real place to shoot this film for authenticity's sake. And I think he made a great choice because it shows in the final film. But it, it, it basically, you know, it made the film difficult times 20 to make in terms of how do you get this stuff done in the real ocean that is not going to, you know, you can't control it. It's, you're going to have to just go with the waves, you know. So, um, but the cast screening, or I should say the, 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 the local screen that they had on the vineyard blew everybody away. We didn't expect the film to be so good and so scary, particularly when you were there and you saw the sharks and they were, you know, they were towing them from Oak Bluffs Harbor, a place called Shark City, out to the location to shoot the film. And they were moving around all the time. And, you know, they didn't move. They didn't, you know, they weren't threatening looking. They were large, but mostly it was just, it looked like a big dummy. You know, it looked like a a, a, a a fake shark. And so a bit of the mystique around it was sort of taken out of our, you know, expectations. It was like, okay, there's the shark. It's going out to work on the film again. But the film did such a great job at not making that shark a big part of it and making that tension that we talked about, that suspense, uh, work for us. So that film began my fascination with movies. Um, you know, two years after Jaws came out, I was uh, watching Star Wars in the exact same movie theater. And 1977, between Star Wars and Spielberg's follow-up, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, um, and then the movies of the 80s that followed, Raiders of the Lost Ark, the next Star Wars movies, Empire Strikes Back, we were, you know, we were so happy as kids to have movies like now be so well-made and great adventure stories. 
um, and things like The Exorcist and Alien, like horror was having a real resurgence at the time. Um, you know, suspense and action and adventure were, you know, really coming into their own. And um, we, it was just a great time to be a film fan, you know, back then, 70s to mid 80s, even late 80s. Um, so um, it made me get into entertainment and media. So I work t today in, uh, in uh, media. I'm, I'm a colorist and an online editor for WGBH in Boston working on the series Frontline, uh, the uh, PBS series, mm -hmm. and Nova, a science series, and, and a couple of other clients. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not entertainment-based, but it's, um, it's media, and it's, it's a technical job, and I really enjoy the content. But uh, I, I always look at that experience when I was younger as being the reason that I got into it, you know. Yeah. Um, the reason I got into this project was I met somebody at work, this gentleman John Campo Piano that I was talking about before and John is a huge collector of Jaws he actually has a section of the Orca's hull of a fiberglass part of it and when he heard I confessed to someone that I was an extra in Jaws he had to rush over introduce himself and like talk about it and you know ask me about what part I was in the film and and we became fast friends but it got my mind thinking around, I hadn't thought about Jaws for decades, probably. You know, I mean, I always remember it's a great film and it would come out every summer on like some release or people would talk about it as, you know, because now in the Boston area, we have sharks. Great white sharks are all along Cape Cod and the islands. So I just started talking about it with them. And the more we talked about it, I started to gravitate towards the story of what it took to make that movie not the film itself. I love the film. I think it's a really, it's one of Spielberg's best made films in my opinion. But the actual process of how they got that film made to me is really interesting because it was a nightmare production. It's probably one of the most famous hard film stories of production in the world. And often the footnote that people use is the shark didn't work and it was difficult. And in the time that I've spent over the last two and a half years researching this project, Making the Monster, which is basically about the production of the film, not about the film itself, but what it took to you know, pull together the, the ability to make it, um, that's the tip of the iceberg. The challenges on Jaws were like, you know, the shark not working was just one of the problems. Um, they had millions of problems over the 159-day the shoot. It was supposed to be 55 days, it went to 159, Wow. They were there, um, you know, nearly six months and spent another month and a half, you know, picking up stuff in L.A. and off Catalina Island and then getting into post-production. And, uh, you know, they birthed the blockbuster. They actually created the summer blockbuster and no film had made $100 million up to that point. When they thought they were, you know, Spielberg was worried about being fired most of that film. And, uh, and and was thought his career was over. And a lot of people thought, you know, a lot of the crew renamed the film Flaws instead of Jaws because there were so many problems. And even Richard Dreyfuss, uh, in interview, was uh, confessing. He said, don't blame Steven Spielberg for why Jaws is going to fail. It was rushed into production. Um, Jaws was rushed into production because, A, the book was still on the bestseller list, the, the Peter Benchley novel. Mm -hmm. And so the studio really wanted to capitalize on that, you know, was, the book was still hot and people are still paying attention to it. So let's get the movie out. There was also a writer's strike that was going to happen. And uh, the strike basically forced the film into production because any film that started after a certain date would not be allowed to uh, mm -hmm. shoot. So there was a couple factors that made that happen. That's the reason the shark didn't work. It's not that the special effects team, led by Joe Alves, who designed the shark, and then Roy Arbogast, who was the one who kind of made sure the mechanics of it worked. Um, they were told by even, you know, General Dynamics, a defense contractor, that they needed a year and a half to make that shark work in the ocean. And Joe Alves and Roy Arbogast got that shark together in three and a half months. Wow. So the fact that a, 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 a war contractor, defense company, said they'd need 18 months, and these guys did it in three and a half, they're lucky they had a shark at all. And it certainly had challenges, and they, they had to work on location to solve those challenges. But um, So uh, there's all these stories related to the, the making of Jaws that I think are incredible stories that have really not been explored. There's been a couple documentaries um, 
The Shark is Still Working, great documentary by Eric Hollander and James Gillette. Um, uh, a couple of other documentaries, uh, E! Uh, Entertainment Television did the, true, the E! True Hollywood Story about the making of Jaws. But documentaries are, you know, a way of telling a story about a, a troubled film. I want to create a docudrama. I want to do the Apollo 13 story, casting actors to play the roles of the crew and to pick the stories in a very human and really, you know, in an immersive way so that you really feel like you're watching a movie about the making of Jaws and that you get sucked into, you know, great actors with great dialogue and great scripts but they're actually out on an orca and they're out on the, they had a barge called the SS garage sale, which was where they controlled the shark from. And it was had a couple uh, twin, um, uh, you know, uh, prop engines on the back to move it around slowly. Um, you know, it was, there was an armada of support vessels on the ocean to get jaws done. And uh, every day, everybody was, you know, often seasick and uh, you know, cold. And sometimes they didn't get a single shot in the can that was usable. And they were out there 18 hours a day and got no footage. And stuff like that would drive anybody crazy and think, how are we ever going to get this done? You know, like this film is not going to get made. You know, mm -hmm. you, you're already 30, 40, 50 days over the schedule and you're still so far from the end. Mentally, that's got to just tax everybody into thinking, we're screwed. Like, <laughs> so I think that's really interesting. People, you know, drama is essentially throwing people into a situation that is harder than they ever imagined it to be and them having to rise above and meet the challenge and succeed. And that's the making of Jaws. It ultimately was a success and the ultimate redemption story. Um, and, uh, and I think that's what's really exciting about it. So making the monster, uh, the plan is between now and the 50th anniversary, so we, we literally have five years, um, we're going to mount this production and we want to do six one hour episodes or one hour ish episodes. You know, people are streaming stuff online, so you don't have to fit into a, you know, 56, 46 time slot necessarily. If you're doing it on Netflix or Amazon or, mm -hmm. or Apple TV, you can make them as long as you think you've got the attention span for. Um, so it'll be six parts of uh, the making of Jaws. Uh, all the way from when the, the uh, crew shows up on the vineyard with the sharks to when the movie comes out and is a rousing success and how it uh, birthed the blockbuster. Um, so I'm excited as hell to tell the story. It's a very expensive, very demanding project. I've made some alliances that I can talk about when the time is right um, that are going to help come, uh, make it come to fruition. And, uh, you know, I'm very, you know, I'm very excited and humbled to be a part of working on a project. I think that personally I have a connection to because I was in the film, but also because I find it to be a really wonderful opportunity to tell a story that most of the people who I've interviewed, and I've interviewed guys like Joe Alves, who designed the shark, Cal Accord, who was a special effects man who worked on uh, the, the, the shark all summer long, um, Carl Gottlieb, the screenwriter. Um, they agree this story needs to be told in this way to honor what those those crew members went through because you know I, I don't take anything away from Steven Spielberg but I think a lot of the stories that have been told are basically Steven Spielberg you know made a miracle happen with this movie and he did a great job directing Jaws I have no you know I, I don't challenge that but Steven Spielberg directed Jaws the hundreds of other people that work behind the scenes to get it on the screen provided the opportunity to have that directing vision realized. And, um, you know, those, those are often unsung heroes of filmmaking, uh, the people who work their butts off um, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, for three and a half, four months straight, and have no breaks, didn't get to enjoy Martha's Vineyard like people do going for the summer and, you know, hanging out and eating clam uh, rolls. They had, they had a job to do every day, and they, uh, they got it done. Um, and I think that uh, it's about time they get recognized their due credit for what they did. Because they created a classic film that today, Jaws is still the reigning summer, summer blockbuster film that everybody thinks about, you know, when it comes to... And now we've got people who equate, you know, Jaws with COVID. You know, it's like, the, it's the summer of COVID. It's shut down the beaches. It's like, you know, ruin the summer for the, the town of Amity. And the mayor or, you know, the politicians want to get the economy open again. And they don't want things to start up all over. 
but it ain't safe, folks. It's just not really safe. We're seeing the numbers spike already. So um, there's all these parallels. And if you read the newspaper and magazines, you can easily Google search and find 15 different articles right now written in the last six weeks about how JAWS is still relevant today to what's going on. And, uh, and how, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a lightning in a bottle movie. It, there is nothing like it, I think, in terms of its lasting power to remain in, in our culture mm -hmm. and our ability to feel a connection to something that everybody feels, you know, there, it's almost a perfect film. It has its flaws. Every, no, no movie is perfect. But even Jaws's imperfections are somehow loved a little bit more than other films. And so um, that's really what uh, I, I think, it, it, you know, makes it special and why I want to do this project. Nice. That was an amazing answer. <laughs> <laughs> I almost forgot the question. I don't think if it wasn't for this green screen, I would have forgot the question that I asked. But <laughs> you're right about Jaws. Oh, Jaws is like a damn near perfect horror movie. And I believe on this show, I know we rated it. We gave, I think I gave it a nine out of 10 and everybody else, the other two guys and one or two people gave it like a 10 out of 10, just because the, the whole, it's one of those movies to where like, for me, I watch it maybe like once or twice a year. When I get in my shark fixes, I'll start out with Jaws. And then just, you know, you start up at the top and I'm just like, all right, now it's time to go downhill. It's time to go, <laughs> it's time to just go down with these shark movies. But um, Jaws is one of those movies that I can say, I don't, I'm not going to say I watch it all the time. Like I said, I watch it about once, maybe twice a year. But I remember it so, like every time I'm watching the movie, I'm like, okay, I remember this scene. I remember this scene. I remember this scene. I don't really, have, it's one of those movies to where, it sticks with you. Like once you watch it a few times, it really sticks with you to the point where you don't really have to be looking at the screen, so to speak, to know what's going on. You could be eating, you could be having like a conversation with somebody talking about the movie and just kind of, or editing or whatever the case may be. And it's like, yeah, I remember this movie so well. And every, every single time I watch it, or I'm about to watch it. I'm always thinking like, damn, I haven't seen it in a little bit. I forgot, you know, I forget it. You kind of like, just cause you're not watching it. But then as soon as you play it, as soon as the music starts, as soon as the first scene happens, the first couple of you're like, I remember this whole damn, I remember this whole damn movie. Maybe not word for word, but kind of like scene for scene. Like I know what's coming up next, so to speak. And that's another thing I think I really love about the movie. It's, it's something that's very unforgettable. And it's something that it's, it's was, came out in 1975. It is now 2020 and it still holds up to this day. And I feel another 45 years from now, when that movie's 90 years old or 100 years old, I feel like it's still going to stand stand up to that, you know, to what people ex – it's still going to stand up to that time. There's going to be a handful of people that are still – well, more than a handful that are, you know, that were alive when that movie – that were alive and seen that movie before, like, the next generation comes in that just – they're like, wow, this movie – I seen this movie when I was a kid 20, 30 years ago, and it's still great, and it came out, you know, 100 years ago. I think that's awesome. And that's one movie that I can say is going to stand to where it should be like, I don't know, maybe even a damn history book one day, something or like some sort of history museum as far as like, this is one of the greatest movies that was made, greatest horror movie that was made, not only the greatest horror movie, but one of the greatest movies ever made as far as the impact it had on people. Like this movie alone made millions of people terrified of the ocean to this day, even to where it's like, they won't go in the, I'm, I'm not going to say this movie did it for me, because I have been in the ocean here and there, but it helped. It did. It did. It didn't make me want to go to the ocean anymore. I will say that. I will say that. I'm like, okay, there's right. there's sharks in there, but I'm like, I, I know there's more than just sharks in there that can, at the very least, injure me. So I I know you know I'm good, but I just I really enjoy the movie, and it's just like uh, even like I said, even now like they have like the first few just in a few horror groups I'm in where they're having drive-ins open up. Jaws is actually one of the movies we're showing a lot. They're showing Jaws and Jurassic Park, like, back-to-back. -back. I think that's awesome. And then you see, like, I'm sure you've seen it online, too, with the pictures of on Facebook, like, where people are, I don't know where they're watching this, but they're all in, like, they have, like, they're in, like, inner tubes or whatever and just watching Jaws in water. Right. And me, I'm like, okay, some people might do this in, like, a little lake or pond or whatever the case may be. If I'm doing something like that, I got to be in a fool. I'm not doing this in any other type of thing. I don't want nothing brushing up against me, scaring the hell out of me, making me scream like a girl watching Jaws because I got scared of, like, seaweed hitting my foot. Like, I, 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 in a pool, in a pool is even kind of, I'm not going to say it's scary, but just the simple fact of 
because you'd be watching it at night and you know there's gonna be people in there messing with you and your mind plays tricks on you i don't know why like even like this movie right here too as a kid for some strange reason i would think here and there going swimming in my in a pool like my aunt's pool friend's pool or whatever what if there's a shark in there? What if somebody puts a shark in here? Obviously, you know, they can't breathe. They can't survive in that. But watching these type of movies as a kid, your mind plays those crazy tricks on you. Your imagination runs nuts, which I do kind of miss that because I miss that fear factor of watching certain movies, Jaws included, where it's just like, oh, shit. But no, you're like, it's not real. All right. I think one part that still gets me in Jaws is when um, Brody, and I can't think of his name, is With, it Cooper? Yes. I think you, you probably know the scene I'm going at. They go check out the one, you know, the one boat that's kind of by itself in the water because the guy gets killed. They jump in the water, grab the tooth, and then see the skeleton fall out and sink. To this day, I still jump at that. And I know it's coming up, but some for some reason, I'm just like, oh, shit. <laughs> and I'm not, like, I'm not a jumper, but like that was a really, really good, really powerful jump scene. And I think it's one of those things where, like, I know horror movies, you know when the jump scares are going to come, but it's it's so, like, calm and peaceful when they're in there looking for what they're looking for. And then his reaction, too, when he's, he's screaming underwater and drops the tooth, I'm just like, you got me again. <laughs> you got me yeah. Again. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people keep jumping at that. Um, and uh, it's, it's one of those remembered shots in the film that everybody kind of, it's always the centerpiece moment in Jaws that people are, you know, are freaked out by. Um, interesting anecdote about that is that that was a shot that was not actually uh, filmed on Martha's Vineyard during the, the film. And it was a uh, uh, Steven Spielberg and Universal decided to do a screening, uh, a sneak preview. You know, it's like the focus group part of the film mm -hmm. where they'll take it and they'll show it to a, an audience they invite. And um, so they did one in Dallas, Texas, uh, one of the first screenings, public screenings of Jaws. And uh, they showed it, and Spielberg got this idea. He goes, I think I can get one more scare out of the audience, because that shot wasn't in the film yet. They didn't have that in there. So Spielberg felt that he could do it, but Universal Studios said, we're done spending the money on this movie. If you want to add anything else, you, you go right ahead, but it's, it's not coming out of our production budget. So Steven Spielberg put together $3,000 of his own money, and he went to the editor, uh, Verna Fields. She had a, a pool in California, and they shot that scene in a pool wow. in her backyard. And um, just not the whole boat scene. They did that on a, on a, a lake, in, um, uh, a man-made lake at Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. But that actual insert shot of the head falling through the, that hole in the boat um, was basically in uh, Joe Alves built a small section of the Orca Hall just big enough to fit the frame of the camera, what the camera saw. And the pool, they poured milk into the pool to cloudy it up, make it feel more ocean-like, you know? So it, uh, and, they, um, uh, and they had the foam head, and they did it a couple times, but, um, you know, and they had a stunt guy. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't Richard Dreyfuss that they put in there for that shot. They did a, a, a basically, Dick Warlock was a, a stuntman. And they just did the over-shoulder shot of him with the head falling through. And uh, they shot it in the pool, and the editor cut it. She was doing, you know, a, 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 a moviola, old editing system, basically, film splicing and gluing and all that stuff. So she put it right together, you know, literally 10 feet away from where they just shot it, you know. Mm. Um, and the next screening was in L.A. And at that screening, the head shot that you're talking about was in the film. And when that shot was inserted and the audience reacted, one guy ran right past Steven Spielberg and threw up on the lobby floor. Oh, wow. And he said, I got it. That's it. That's, it was totally worth it. That $3,000 was money well spent. And it's still one of the most often talked about shots in Jaws, that that shot is what everybody gets freaked out by in terms of that, that scare that, you know, ups the stakes. It's like, okay, yeah, it's killed another one, you know, one more. And now we see a decapitation. You know, a lot of the deaths in Jaws are fairly off camera, mm -hmm. you know, or that you just see a little part of it. But a decapitated head to fall into the shot is like probably the most graphic thing. Besides Quint's death when he gets like literally eaten by the shark and pulled yeah. under, you know. Um, but that, pre that foreshadows that. It's like, okay, yeah, there's this, this film's about to get real. 
You know, it's, it's, it's going to show you the real depth. And so I think the audience, it's like a, an amusement park ride, you know, you get mm -hmm. higher and higher and fire, higher in the, on the roller coaster. And finally it's like, okay, yeah, it's going to be scary. And that's what I think the film does really well is ratchet up the tension and then start to deliver like, okay, it's going to get even worse than you thought it was. And, and, and if you're already afraid, we'll be prepared to get even more afraid. It's going to get worse. So I think that's what Jaws does well is keep you advancing in your fear to the next level. Yeah, it does. It really does. And with that scene too, I mean, I, I, off the top of my head, I can't really think of a top 10 list, but I feel like as far as jump scares, like if you pick one jump scare from X amount of horror movies, I feel like I'd be in the top 10 just because of the suspense of it. And you're just like, holy crap. And going back to what you said about how you don't really see too many kills in the movie. I enjoy that with this movie. And I think it worked. It's another thing that worked for its time. It works for Jaws because it's like, Nowadays, you do have the blood, guts, and gore, which me personally, I do love it. But with a movie like Jaws, I'll even use the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where a lot of the kills were off screen, if not all of them. The scare factor worked for it because it's like you knew it was happening. And as far as like kills off scene, but it's on screen at the same time, like as far as uh, with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there's a lot of kills where you see like the hammer come up and come down, but you didn't see it hit the actual person. And in Jaws, you see people getting dragged underwater, kind of, you know, moving around or thrashing, like, with the first girl. But right. you don't see the shark at all, you don't see her getting killed. And I I like that about that. I like that about those two movies, because I feel like those... I didn't even think about it until we started discussing Jaws. I feel like those are the top two movies where you have, like, the on-screen slash off-screen kills in a sense of it's happening on-screen, but you're not seeing it on-screen. And I think they do it so well and so... Actually, I'll say perfect for those two films to where I don't feel like any other films, at least not to, not to my knowledge as of right this second, that can do that well of it. Because, again, with a film making it now, you're expecting to see the kill. You're expecting to see the disaster happen. Versus back then, I know there was different laws and different rules where it's like, okay, well, if you put this in, you got to make it this type of rating. And it changes the things. But it worked, it worked for it at the same time. It worked perfect for both of those movies. Yeah, I, I, I think that that's, there's, a, there's an art form to creating suspense and horror and tension that, um, you know, it's like an orchestra, you know, there's a way you play the, the fear um, and that you, you uh, have a composition to it, you know, you warm audiences up to it and then you start to, you know, pull them in slowly and, and that's when you have their full attention and their full anticipation about being scared and so forth that's when you get the real moments that you can play with them you know and i think that that's the thing is uh good filmmakers play an audience sort of like uh you know a song the way a song works is that you know you feel those moments the structure to it and the structure um you know and, and it, but you have to be unpredictable if you really want to scare people you know things that are not really all that well forecast and you don't know it's going to happen or it, you know it's it's coming, but you are the audience is is enjoying being part of the of the the joke or the um, the lead in. They're like, okay, I get it. You're pulling me in. The tension's building. It's kind of like a Quentin Tarantino film when, mm -hmm. like, you know, a scene where there's a bit of a confrontation starting to heat up, and you know, if you watch enough Quentin Tarantino, you know it's just gonna blow up in your face. You know, like it's all gonna go bad, but mm -hmm. we're gonna spend 25 minutes. Like an Inglorious Bastards in the basement when you know the spies are down there with the um, uh, with the Nazis and they spend that they play that game with the cards on their head and they're talking about you know these and you just realize there's a bit of cat and mouse game going on and all of a sudden there's a huge shootout that everything ends in five minutes but it's that you're watching because you're like okay when does this go bad I know it's going to go bad yep. <laughs> I'm just waiting for the moment like what's the critical moment that everything turns on a dime now and you're 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 hooked you're totally into it you're ready to go there um so the um the, we're involved in this project making the monster and, and the what happened unfortunately was that covid like for everybody basically changed everybody's plans you know we were we were moving along making some progress and um we just uh one of the things that i was doing towards the project was i acquired a boat that was going to become the new orca um, because we need one for making the monster. If we're going to shoot a show about the making of Jaws, mm -hmm. the last half of Jaws is the Orca, 
reactors and the shark out there on the water. So um, I sought out and purchased a wood boat that uh, is uh, very similar to the way the Orca was, but the Orca was created from another boat called the Warlock and uh, was converted to look like the Orca. And uh, these old Nova Scotia fishing boats are not like, you can't get a make or model. It's not like you get a Ford Escort to turn into or a, or a DeLorean to turn into the Back to the Future car. Mm -hmm. um, these boats were made by fishermen and lobstermen, um, kind of based on a similar design, but not mass produced in any way. So finding an exact match to what would become the Orca is a little bit of a needle in a haystack problem. So I purchased that boat about a year and a half ago and put it on Martha's Vineyard with a gentleman named Chris Crawford, who is basically the guy who made the original Orca uh, with Joe Alves. Um, and, uh, and I said, we're going to keep this here until we're ready to start shooting this show. And, uh, you know, we'll definitely get the job and, and let's, let's just put it here on the property for now and, and be, uh, be ready to, to move. Well, the, we can't move as quickly because of COVID. So I decided uh, upon a different project and the project we are now currently engaged in is called Return of the Orca. And we are going to take this boat and turn it into the next Orca which hasn't existed for almost 30 years now because the original was lost. It was taken off Martha's Vineyard, brought to Universal Studios, left to rot in the, uh, the, the lake, and is gone, was taken apart and demolished. And nobody's ever created another since, which to me is kind of interesting because it's, it's not a DeLorean, it's a boat, and it's a wood boat. Mm -hmm. It's not really all that hard to necessarily create another orca, um, it just somebody hasn't taken the initiative to do it. I know there are other people who are trying to do it, but they're doing it on their own financing. Um, or they bought a boat and it's similar, but they're doing it as a personal hobby project or um, yeah. for whatever reason, they're limited in their ability to basically get it done very quickly. Um, so we're going to do this. Um, and uh, we are um, we're in the middle of a crowdfunding campaign uh, to basically fund the entire build of the boat with Chris Crawford as basically leading the charge with a whole bunch of experienced boat people, boat builders on Martha's Vineyard. Joe Alves, the production designer of Jaws, has agreed to be the art director and make sure that we do the actual conversion to look as much like the Orca as, as, as it was. And right down to the paint color, and uh, they actually, um, the orca was painted to have like seagull shit all over it, you know, to make it look like it had been weathered and was out there on the ocean as Quint's fighting vessel. So um, we got to go through all the steps to basically do all that work to make it look exactly like the orca as much as we possibly can. But the orca is going to have a new, uh, new mission. And her mission now will be that uh, in, in two parts, um, uh, well, I should say in three parts, really. Uh, when the boat is restored, uh, what we would like to do is we would like to, um, and we've already gotten a commitment from Wendy Benchley, who's the chairperson of Beneath the Waves, which is a uh, nonprofit uh, uh, ecology marine uh, organization. And uh, they're going to stage, um, uh, basically, uh, it'll be a platform of shark research uh, done off of Martha's Vineyard in Cape Cod. Um, so we're going to use the orca to go from a shark hunting and fighting and killing vessel into a shark research vessel nice. because we need it. Um, there's many more sharks in the water now thanks to the seal population off uh, Cape Cod and the islands. And uh, the, the threat is only getting larger. We, have, uh, we had our fatality, first and only fatality in 80 years from a great white shark attack uh, two years ago off Wellfleet and on Cape Cod. A uh, young man was uh, boogie boarding at dusk, and uh, you know it's that's not the right time of day to be out in the ocean when there are sharks. They they hunt at uh, dusk and dawn, and mm -hmm. if there are seals around, that's where they're going to be. And unfortunately, this this young guy was not aware of these conditions. The um, the one thing I've learned about the shark problem that we have now in our area is that education is the only defense. There's no turning back the clock and getting the sharks out of here. The seals are here. There's hundreds of thousands of them. Mm -hmm. They're basically, you know, they're the tater tot for sharks. They love to eat seals. Um, so we have a shark problem and it's not going away, much like Matt Hooper said in the film. And uh, 
the other purpose of the of the boat will be, um, you know, me having grown up on Martha's Vineyard, I want to be able to provide it as a um, a fun excursion vehicle for a camp called Camp Jabberwocky, which are kids that are um, disabled and uh, have learning disabilities, and uh, want to give them a place that they can go for free for the day to enjoy some time on the ocean. Um, and uh, they have they have full summer programs for them, but this will be one more thing that they can go out and do for uh, a few hours a day and enjoy their time, um, uh, you know, in the ocean and being in a beautiful place like Martha's Vineyard. And finally, we want Jaws fans to be able to enjoy the boat and uh, come to Martha's Vineyard, or Amity as it's known, and go out on the Orca. And, uh, you know, if we can drag a big great white fin behind us or something to, you know, add to the thrill, mm -hmm. um, and uh, maybe serve you drinks and little yellow barrel mugs, um, we'll do that. Um, it all depends on how much support we receive and uh you know what we can do but we want it to remain on the vineyard to be a vessel that is enjoyed for shark research by these camp counts uh camp kids um and uh other people on martha's vineyard including jaws fans and uh hopefully it turns into a self-sustaining uh entity that can be there summer after summer for people to enjoy you know obviously COVID is going to be a big factor in how well we are uh, able to succeed in this project um, but, um, you know, with the support of people like Wendy Benchley, uh, whose husband wrote Jaws, um, and other people, Greg Scomel, the, the, the Matt Hooper of, Mar of Cape Cod, uh, mm -hmm. who is also involved with our project, and he's going to actually go out on the Orca, and we're going to research the waters around Martha's Vineyard and get a real accurate survey of what great whites are doing in that area so that people are much more informed. Um, because on Cape Cod, they really know what's going on, but on the vineyard, it's not really well studied and we want to be able to fill in the holes and let people know that there's a shark problem. It's just, they haven't really paid attention to it. So yeah. let's do that with the orca and, uh, you know, make it, uh, evolve it, give it a new mission and make it something that will, um, be, uh, you know, be for a really good reason. It, you know, have people be able to take advantage of it now and bring some attention to it because the, the, the orca hasn't existed until we make this boat um, for, uh, for decades now. And I think it'll be uh, an interesting story for people to tell, and it will probably shed a little bit of light on some of the research and charity aspects of what we want to do with the boat. So um, we're looking for everybody's support. Uh, if you go to uh, www.returnoftheorca.com, uh, you'll be able to you know, be involved in the project if you like. Um, we're going to have some really cool um, perks available for people that are related to the project. Uh, we got a beautiful logo created by Eric Hollander, um, who, does, who created the logo for The Meg, the movie The Meg, mm -hmm. and, uh, and also directed the uh, documentary The Shark is Still Working. Um, and Eric is an extremely talented artist who uh, did a great job in putting our, our, our logo and our iconography together. So, um, yeah, we just want uh, to, we hope this project will be a success and we, we hope some of your viewers will uh, come aboard. They better. <laughs> I'll tell them right now, you, listen, you either come aboard or you're getting fed to Bruce. That's your option. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that sounds freaking awesome. And I mean, I definitely want to help out any way I can with that. And like the, the simple fact, just out of everything you've said, what you guys are doing to work. I feel like the most important thing and the most rewarding thing is you're doing it for, for disabled children. I think that's amazing. Just for them to get the experience of going out on the boat for, for a couple hours a day or however long, even for just an hour, just to go out there, learn, probably learn a few things and just be out on the water and just kind of have a good time and then come back home and tell people about it. And just, that's one of those experiences that they're never, ever, ever going to forget, like, hey, I got to be, you know, I was on this boat when I was a kid or whatever the case may be. And I think that's amazing. It's also cool that you guys are going to be doing research on sharks. And then as far as the horror fan, and the Jaws, for the Jaws fan, go out on the boat and kind of just have a good time. Now, me personally, I'll let you know right now, I won't go on the boat because I'm, I don't, I'm scared of boats. I'm scared of boats. <laughs> now, if it's docked, you know, it's docked, like, hey, I can go walk around on the boat and then come right back off. I could do that. I'm cool with that, but going out in the middle of the, it's just, it's just not me. <laughs> but I do want to, so I do have, I do want to support it. So I really do want to back the, is it going to be like an Indiegogo? Yes, it'll, it's on Indiegogo. Um, and, uh, you know, your, your program and other programs, we're going to be doing a really hard push with the media campaign. So it becomes, everybody becomes aware of it. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the perks that we're going to be including, 
uh, that are, are part of the campaign uh, T-shirts with the Return of the Orca logo on them. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to have movie posters, uh, which will be Return of the Orca, but obviously it's not a movie, but it'll, it'll, the cast and the crew will basically be the people putting the boat together. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be a beautiful poster with our logo. And, um, and we're even looking at the uh, Brew Shark UK who created that shark over there. Some people at the, in the high bidding area will actually get a chance to get one of the 50 inch sharks, the big shark, the biggest one they offer. Um, so uh, we're just, you know, we want to be able to make people feel like they have some collectible item uh, because a lot of these things will be limited edition and uh, we will uh, be selling merch and so forth uh, after the project is done and the campaign is finished. But some of these things will only be available for the particular, uh, you know, uh, fundraising drive of the Indiegogo campaign. And uh, we want people to know that they can hold on to those and hopefully someday they'll be worth something more than they, they put in for the campaign to be able to get. Um, but, um, you know, at the end of the day, I hope that people are supporting the project because they feel a connection to, you know, the boat doing more good or what we want to do with it than just being a cool Orca from the movie Jaws, that it, uh, it, 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 it attracts attention because of that, but it really has a, a mission um, that we believe in strongly is going to be a real uh, force for good and, and change people's lives, hopefully, and, and, and maybe even save a life or two by helping with the education effort. Um, but definitely, you know, uh, giving some of these disabled kids an opportunity to enjoy the ocean and, uh, and, and maybe something that uh, otherwise wouldn't be part of their program. So, um, you know, I think that right now with COVID and everything going on, there's been a lot of bad news in the media, you know, a lot of the, the protests and the disruption. I mean, we're going through a really tricky time and we're just trying to be a little bit of a silver lining in what right now is a very challenging bleak period in America and uh, in a lot of the world who are dealing with COVID as well. So um, if we can provide a little bit of uh, hope and uh, positivity, uh, we'd like to be a part of that effort. I agree with you 1 million percent on that. And again, that's just, I just think it's an awesome project. I think it's an awesome idea, an amazing idea. And I really do, I have a good feeling that it'll do good because once people hear like, again, with Jaws fans, they're, they're doing the Orca again and we get a chance, not me in particular. I told you how I, got, I told you guys how I feel about boats, but for those of you who don't have that fear of boats in the ocean, who love the boats in the ocean, like you'll have a chance to go on the Orca by backing this project. You'll have a chance to go on that, boat and have a good time as you're saying with the which i do want one of those barrel cups <laughs> <laughs> but you know they'll have a chance to go on the boat and experience that and also be a part of the project like say if you don't go on if you're someone like me you're scared to go on the boat cool you get to be a part of something as far as backing this project like you said possibly if you're one of the higher bidders getting one of those bruce sharks or getting a t-shirt or getting a cool poster or any other perks that you guys are going to have out there so it's going to be limited to X amount of people. Yes, you like you said, you're going to have more merch, but there's going to be certain things where it's like, if you're not a part of this Indiegogo, you're not going to be able to be, you know, you're not going to be able to get it, which is fine, which is fair, but it's just cool. It'd be cool to back something. And as like a, a horror fan, it's cool with Indiegogos in general. I'll say it's speaking for me because it's like, I was a part of this. Like I, my, say $40 to get the Blu-ray, for example, helped make this project go versus the project's done, the project's out, and you go buy it, or you go buy a movie from, <clears throat> say, Walmart. Yes, you still got that horror movie from Walmart, but it's like, if you get a chance to back it, it's like, I was a part of helping this come out. Some of them, they throw your name in the credits. That's cool, too. That's cool as well, but it's just, it's just one of those things where it's like, it makes it inclusive for fans. It makes it very inclusive for fans, which as me, speaking for myself, I know a lot of other fans are the same way, but speaking for myself, it's just like, it makes you kind of want to do it more, just for that simple reason. You can only throw $5 in. It makes you want to do it more just for the simple fact, like, my couple of dollars really did help go towards building this goal for this film. And once the project comes out and it's awesome, you're like, that's cool. Like, I wasn't in it, but I was a part of it just because I helped fund it, which I think is an awesome thing. And as well as not only funding it, like, for me, you're, you're on my show, which I would love to have you on again if you want to ever promote more. But um, it's hitting that share button as well. Just if you can't afford to fund it, you can afford to hit share at the very least. Like, Hey, check this out. This is a cool project. Everybody should be a part of it. If everybody chips in X amount of dollars, you don't have to chip in $10,000. You can't afford it. If you can chip in 20 bucks. Cool. Whatever you can chip in and make this awesome project come out. And like I said before, it's a huge thing because again, the most important thing is 
I'll tell you the one thing, the number one most important thing is you guys are doing it for the children, which is amazing. You're doing it for the disabled children and they get that experience of going out on the water. Second most important thing, research. Research on the ocean, research on sharks, which all of us, especially if you're a fan of going in the ocean, you can be more educated on that. And then third, which is important too for Jaws fans, you get to ride the boat. Like there's there's no reason not there, those three reasons are perfect three perfect reasons there's no reason not to do it <laughs> so it's like if you could afford to you know five bucks would help five listen people five dollars can go a long way if all of us do it that can help a whole lot it's five dollars out of your pocket if you can afford more obviously throw in more get one of these cool perks get one of the cool shirts I'm gonna have one on I'm definitely gonna get a shirt at the very least and I'll see what other perks I can afford and go from there and everybody should do the same thing. It's that simple, really. No, I appreciate that. Um, it's uh, it's true. I think that we really we're not looking for people to you know have to sacrifice a huge amount of money to be able to be a part of the project. I think that um, spreading the word and, and sharing uh, the burden with a lot of people, um, you know, reaching out to as many as possible. You know, we're not. This is not. Um, you know, we don't need a million dollars to build a boat. You know, we, we we don't need what it takes to put some feature films together. Uh, we need uh, a reasonable sum of money that um, uh, the, 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 the community of JAWS can, I think, easily handle being able to provide as long as everybody gives, um, you know, some amount, uh, whatever it is possible to give. Um, and I think that uh, JAWS is an internationally, you know, recognized fan film. People love it all over the world. And, uh, and reaching out to all the fans who feel like they want to be a part of this and if they have five dollars or four dollars or ten dollars or whatever they you know whatever they feel like they can give, um, you know we just need the volume. We need a, you know as many people to be a part of the project. And we you know it would feel wonderful to us to you know I, there's probably you know we could find somebody who would probably you know independently as wealthy and say here I'll give you the money. You got the boat. Get to work and you know um, uh, maybe yeah. I'll take a cut of those beverages in the barrels. You know when you're making money. Um, which is not the point of the project, but I would feel better about knowing that the community of, of support came from the community of JAWS and people who believe in our mission and feeling that we all together made this happen and that we all share a connection to the fact that that boat is in that water and those kids are enjoying it and the research is happening and that, um, you know, this is something that we all did together and, uh, you know, community uh, grassroots projects um, have been, you know, a, a great uh, thing for uh, for a long time that people have gotten together and made happen. And there's a lot of power in that, and mm -hmm. uh, and and the belief that people have uh, behind that and the unity that it creates, I think, speaks volumes about what you know our our best assets and our best attributes as a as a culture are able to to forge together. Um, so you know, uh, one of the people I talked to recently is like. If you just reach a million Jaws fans and they each give you 50 cents, you're there. <laughs> you know, like, you got it. You got more than you need. You know, it's it's just reaching as many people as possible and getting the word out. And, and that's what we want to do is make sure that the people are aware of it. If you can't give and you just want to follow what we're up to, we don't, you know, we understand. You know, not everybody has the resources these days. But um, we hope if you can that you will support us and, and uh, see a beautiful thing happen. Yeah, see, I'm all about that. I just think it's an amazing thing. I think it's going to be an awesome project when it comes out. And, I mean, again, who wouldn't want that to happen? As far as Jaws fans, I really do I really do feel this Indiegogo is going to be very successful. And I just say that because there's, like you said, there's a lot of Jaws fans. You got to think of the people who've seen it, like yourself, but who got to see it back in 1975 that still watch this movie to this day and that are showing it to their children. And for those of you, so for those of the ones that were adults, you know, or had children of their own that are showing it not to their children or showing it to their grandchildren now, or maybe even great grandchildren, however old people are when they've seen the movie. And then for them to even be a part of like, hey, that's cool. I could, you know, I could be a part of this. Or maybe some of the people that said were extras in the movie, that right there could be a piece. That could be something like a piece from their childhood. Right? I was an extra in this movie when I was a kid. I, I'll happily throw 25 bucks, whatever, whatever the case is. And I just, I want to see it happen. I really do want to see it happen. And I wish I was one of those people who had the money. Like, all right, here's the money. <laughs> I want my cut from the barrels and I want a couple barrels for myself and cool, but I don't have that kind of fun. So I have to throw what I can afford. 
but I can't wait. I can't wait for it to happen. And what I will do is any links that you, I'll have you email them to me when you get a chance to, and when the Indiegogo well, will be live by the time this is out, I'll drop all the links below, like in the description when the episode comes out. So it'll be on like YouTube and every other place where you can listen to the podcast. Great, thank you. And of course, share it all over the place once it's once it's out there. I'll also share it all over and tell people just to go ahead and do it, man. You can do it. <laughs> yeah, thank you. No, we're we're really excited about seeing it happen. You know, I think um, you know, I'm like a father that wants to see you know its kid really grow up and be strong in the world and feel secure about it. And I, mm-hmm. I'm doing everything I can to make sure that um, you know it, that the project has a fighting chance at being you know popular and, and well received. Um, I think the important thing is to be realistic. I mean, we are talking about doing something in the age of COVID when people have lost their jobs and a lot of people are, you know, are struggling. This is, this is a challenging time to be asking for support on projects like this. Um, but, um, you know, it's, again, I think that the, the, the connection to what we're doing in the film and people realizing that this is something that we're doing not to be exploitative or commercial in, in, in its real pursuit but to, um, to be something that, you know, can make differences in people's lives and, uh, and, and create something that doesn't exist in the world and, and just be good, you know? Um, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll have to see how it goes. Um, I'm hopeful, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say we're definitely going to be a success. I think that it, it takes telling this story to a lot of people. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that you're going to be sharing it with uh, your fans and, and your followers. And other people, I want to. I think we need to keep that message going out so that people understand that uh, we can do this together, and it will be a wonderful thing once it's uh, it's finished and, and available. Um, and I want everybody to be able to enjoy it in whatever capacity they can. Not everybody can get to Martha's Vineyard and enjoy the orca if it's uh, once it's in the water, but I do believe that a lot of people can enjoy the fact that they know that they supported uh, a vessel that has uh, you know some really good things that it wants to do for other people and know they were a part of that and feel, um, you know, a connection to positivity in the world. And uh, that's that's the best I could hope for. I'm with you on that. And I, like I said, I do, I won't guarantee people, so don't say, you know, Aaron's a liar. I won't guarantee that it's going to be a successful, but I have a very, very good feeling just because I know that there's millions, millions and millions of Jaws fans all around this freaking globe that love this freak, the love, just the original alone, just love the movie. Love the aspect of the movie, everything about the movie. And I do feel that it will be a success. Like, I even see Facebook groups that are dedicated just to Jaws with, like, over 10,000 people in this group. And that alone is just amazing. I mean, it's, again, this movie's from 1975, and people still love it. Like, it just came out, I'll say, this summer. And really quick, actually, before we wrap up, I did get the chance to see Jaws in theaters. Was it last? I think it was either last summer or the summer before last. But my wife and I went to see it in theaters, and it was just, like, such an amazing experience. I was just like, wow. Like, it's it's cool watching at home on your TV, but then when you get to see it in the theater on the big screen, you're just like, wow. Like, this is this is, this is is so much better. And it almost makes me think, like, damn, I need a bigger TV. Like, I need a TV about this size. <laughs> well, well what, uh, this summer, it came out on 4K. So if you want to watch it in 4K, like, Pretty much 4K is as good as the 35 millimeter print in terms of resolution, mm-hmm. and they did remaster Jaws in uh, 2012. Um, they rescanned the negative and cleaned it up, and so the Jaws you see today is actually better than it ever was um, when they went through that process. But they did the UHD version, which is um, ultra high def, but also HDR. And uh, I'm a I'm a video and technology nerd uh, as a day job, so. High dynamic range HDR is basically like brighter. The colors are richer. There's just more pop, more contrast to it. Mm-hmm. So it just has a much more, a, a really different look to it now. Um, that really makes it very immersive, and it's so sharp. You know, you see every little detail in that frame now, uh, and you can see the texture of Bruce's skin in the film. So uh, there's just some things about seeing it now in the new format that's really great that can create that kind of like viewing experience that's similar to seeing it in cinemas. The one other experience I had watching Jaws uh, last summer, which was great, was on Martha's Vineyard, they showed it in concert. So they had the Cape Cod Symphony Orchestra play the score live with the film. Wow. And you can see it with the full orchestra playing, 
synchronized with the, re the, the rest of the John Williams score. And uh, it was a really great time. Uh, Wendy Benchley actually came and gave the opening. Um, uh, uh, she emceed the evening and talked about and showed even some films from the making of the film that nobody had seen before that were in her private collection. Um, so uh, really great experience. Definitely either the 4K, seeing it in concert, which is a very popular thing, and the one you refer to being in the inner tubes on the lake that a lot of people won't necessarily do, but I think that's at the, you know, it's third down the list on these things that I'm talking about. <laughs> um, the one thing I should add that I, I, I unfortunately neglected to say is that um, I'd forgotten about the fact that we can tell this story because we're already now in the, in the release of the, the campaign, mm -hmm. but um, Making the Monster, the group that has basically put this project together for Return of the Orca, We've joined forces with the Daily Jaws. The Daily Jaws is one of the art largest online groups around uh, Jaws fandom and uh, has a, a very loyal international following, very large, and uh, has a great reach. So um, Ross Williams and the Daily Jaws and I have teamed up our production uh, to basically make the return to the Orca happen, and we're spreading the word together. Um, so we invite you to go to either the dailyjaws.com or returntotheorca.com and uh, both of those places will have information related to uh, how to support the project. Mm -hmm. um, but it's through those, you know, uh, unions of people like Ross and, and the Daily Jaws and us and the rest of the people who are Jaws fans. We want to we want to come together and come aboard together and make this a reality. And we hope you'll be a part of it. That's awesome. I'm definitely going to be a part of it any way that I can. And I, like I said, I can't wait for this to happen. I can't wait for the Indiegogo to. Well, again, when this is out, it's going to be live. So I guess I'm speaking in the past and future. I can't wait to support it. I'll just say that. Great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I think, like, again, it's going to be amazing. And I want to thank you for coming on my show and discussing everything you got to discuss with me. And I would love to have you on again, maybe once Indiegogo is live or a little after, you know, maybe a few weeks after just to kind of, you know, talk about it some and kind of see where things are going. Yeah, I'd love to jump back on with you and, and talk more about it. You know, it, depending upon the success of the campaign, we've got more long range vision ideas of what we can do with the project that uh, kind of builds upon it. You know, at the, excuse me, at the very minimum, having the boat built and being able to fulfill the, mil the missions we've talked about is our, you know, is kind of our, 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 our foundational goal of mm -hmm. what we want to do. But if we're able to exceed that goal and we are able to do things like, you know, get uh, some staff available to be on the boat full time and, and to provide maybe more community outreach and expand our capabilities. There may be more of this story to tell. It really depends upon how well the, the, the crowdfunding campaign goes and uh, what we can do beyond that. Um, we may be even able to build an Orca four or five. I mean, if we're that successful, um, we love more people to enjoy the craft. And so, you know, there, was, there were two Orcas used in Jaws. We're gonna make the third. Maybe we'll be able to make the fourth and the fifth. I don't know. We're not counting our chickens before they hatch, but um, I think there's an ability to look at, you know, um, maybe this project has a lot more life to it than just what we're thinking of now. But I'm a cautious optimist. I think I just want to get to the boat being built in the water, work with Camp Jabberwocky, neat the waves, do the mission we're talking about, and uh, who knows? Maybe there's more to it after that, but uh, that uh, it remains to be seen. That's awesome, man. That's so cool. Now, if there's anything you want to plug, if there's any other places you want people to check out, which you did pretty much just do, you can feel free to go ahead. And then I'll do my end of the show plugs, and then we can just wrap it up. I'll just ask sure. you for like two minutes after I hit stop recording. Okay, no problem. Um, yeah, again, just uh, www.returnoftheorca.com is, is how you'll learn more about the, the project of the Orca 3's uh, rebirth. And, um, of course, uh, you know, we are um, making the monster our group. Uh, we're currently on Facebook and Instagram. If you go to Instagram.com slash making the monster, making the monster is all one word. Uh, you can learn more about our project there. And, of course, uh, the dailyjaws.com. Uh, go ahead and subscribe and check out what the Daily Jaws has. Uh, as they say in their name, the Daily Jaws is every day. They publish something about Jaws related, whether it's stories about the film or the fans or um, uh, they actually just did something really cool um, called the We Make, and the We Make was they literally recreated the entire film Jaws by all the fans sending in a particular shot of the film that they re reenacted. So um, they re they did they made a whole new Jaws based on the original, uh, but it's a blend of animation, 
and stop motion and live action and uh, you know all sorts of creative ways to remake Jaws and it's uh, been very popular. So you definitely want to go over to the Daily Jaws and check that out. So those are my plugs. Awesome, awesome. Thanks again. And everybody, go everything he just followed. Again, the links will be below, but go follow all those links. Go check it out. Definitely support this Indiegogo because I think it's going to be an amazing thing. Again, most importantly, the, what they're doing for the children. And then after that, you could say the research. And again, Jaws fans going on the boat. All that is amazing, amazing, important things. And there's no reason not to back it if you can afford to throw, even like I said, if you can afford to throw even five bucks, that helps a lot. Just think of 10,000 people. Let's just say 10,000 people throwing in $5. I'm not doing the math. I'm terrible at that. I can't add it up in my head. But that's a lot of money right there. That's a decent chunk of change right there. Just five bucks. A million people donating a dollar. That's a million dollars. We're, that, we're, that, on, the, we're on the water. <laughs> yes. yes, they're on the water. And you help make that happen, which I think is very important. You're helping a lot of dreams come. And again, I'm going to go back to the children. Most importantly, you're doing it for the children. You're doing it for the research. And you're doing it for yourself as a Jaws fan and other Jaws fans out there where you have an opportunity if you can make it to that Martha's Vineyard to ride on the boat and have some drinks out of a barrel, which I'm going to get a barrel one way or another without going on this boat <laughs> at <laughs> another time. But yeah, so definitely go follow. Go follow them. Go follow their awesome projects. They're doing awesome, amazing things. And let's see where, you know, let's see where it goes. Let's make this all happen, people. And as far as my listeners... I have a Horror Research 30 Facebook group where you can feel free to share anything and everything horror related. And that includes you too, Dave, with the making of Jaws and anything Jaws horror related, you can throw it right in my group. And uh, I have a Horror Research 30 page that's strictly for the podcast. It's where I'll be dropping all my episodes from here on out instead of sharing it in the group. It's going to go strictly to the Horror Research 30 page. So give the page a like. My YouTube channel where you can watch all the YouTube content I put out, my podcast, and all my other random videos that I do and giveaway videos, which I will start doing again and my first giveaway soon, hopefully. Um, if you ever want to be on the podcast, shoot me an email, horrorwithsearch.sturdy at gmail.com. Again, it's horrorwithsearch30 at gmail.com. I also have a Twitch channel, horror underscore with underscore sir underscore sturdy. And thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. And uh, yes, definitely, definitely back this. And as always, I'll see you in your nightmare.